Rage 2 is here with some fantastic run and gun action that can make you feel like a true superhero. Never mind the vehicles, which aren't nearly as fun. The first time you pull out the shotgun, it just feels right. But what sort of hardware does it take to get the most out of Rage 2? PC Gamer has partnered with MSI for this full performance analysis, including benchmarks on dozens of graphics cards, plus some CPU and notebook testing for good measure. The good news is that Rage 2 runs fine on mid-range hardware, but if you're gunning for 60 FPS, budget cards and older GPUs are going to struggle. That's partly because the game still looks good even at minimum quality, but along with that you won't see a massive improvement in frame rates by dropping the settings. Bottom line, you'll need at least a GTX 1060 or similar performance card to get 60 FPS. That means a previous generation GTX 970 will also suffice, along with AMD's RX 570 or the new GTX 1650. Your CPU meanwhile is less of a factor. Whether it's the Vulkan API or just tight coding, every CPU we tested from the lowly Core i3 up through the Ryzen 5 2400G and above easily breaks 60 FPS. Let's start with the graphics cards, all running on an overclocked Intel Core i7-8700K with an MSI Z390 godlike motherboard to ensure there are no CPU bottlenecks or other limiting factors. Using the low preset at 1080p, the budget GTX 1050 and RX 560 both hover in the 45 to 50 FPS range with AMD's card in the lead. Step up to a mid-range GPU and the GTX 1060 and RX 570 easily break 60 FPS, again with AMD leading. For integrated graphics, AMD's Vega 11 can't quite manage 30 FPS at 1080p, but easily does so at 720p. Intel's HD Graphics 630 is about half as fast at 720p and not really playable, but with resolution scaling set to 50%, it also manages to run okay, with occasional dips. Those with a high 144Hz refresh rate display will want a GTX 1080 or faster graphics card, and even then you'll do best with a G-Sync or FreeSync monitor. Or if you have a 240Hz display, only the 2080 Ti can hit those lofty frame rates. Stepping up to 1080p medium quality drops performance about 20% on most GPUs. It's not a huge change, and all the cards that manage to break 60fps at low quality are still running smoothly. I've switched to Nvidia's newer GTX 1650 and 1660 here, with the budget card trailing AMD's RX 570, while the 1660 just squeaks past the RX 590. AMD continues to be the better value based on current prices, and the Vulkan API certainly helps. Looking at the full results, Vega 56 and above can average 120fps or more, or the GTX 1080 Ti and above will get you to 144fps. If you're only running a 60Hz display, just about any mid-ranged graphics card will suffice. I'm skipping the high preset, as in limited testing there's almost no difference in performance between that and the ultra preset. Most graphics cards take about a 20% hit relative to medium quality, and you get slightly better shadows and object detail. For the GPU comparisons here, the Vega 56 beats the 1660 Ti by around 15%, while the Vega 64 and RTX 2060 are basically tied. Perhaps more importantly, all four GPUs are still well above 60 FPS, including minimum frame rates. Many older GPUs are also still breaking 60 FPS as well, though cards like the GTX 1060 and RX 570 are right on the fence. If you don't want occasional dips below 60, the RX 590 and GTX 1660 and above are required. As for 144 FPS gaming, only the RTX 2080 Ti will suffice, though the Radeon 7 and RTX 2080 come close. With 77% more pixels at 1440p, most graphics cards drop about a third of their performance relative to 1080p. Nvidia's RTX 2070 easily beats the Vega 64, while the Radeon 7 and RTX 2080 are still running neck and neck, with AMD hanging on to a slight lead. These four GPUs generally keep minimum frame rates above 60fps, but most other GPUs will fall short. The GTX 1070 Ti is the last card on the charts to average at least 60fps, but minimum FPS will cause some stuttering or tearing if you're not using a variable refresh rate display. The RTX 2070 and above are all above 60fps minimums, but if you have a 1440p 144Hz display, you'll be sad to know that there's currently no way to max out the refresh rate. And SLI or Crossfire won't help, as Rage 2 has no support for multi-GPU right now, and it's unlikely to get it since it uses the Vulkan API. 
somewhat surprisingly, not even the RTX 2080 Ti can average 60 FPS at 4K Ultra. It's very close, and tweaking a few settings would get it there, but most GPUs run about half as fast at 4K as at 1440p. I can't even imagine most games attempting to run at reasonable frame rates on an 8K monitor. I also dropped a bunch of slower GPUs from testing at 4K, as anything below 30 FPS in Rage 2 starts to slow down movement, physics, and other game world calculations. This is a game that really wants at least 40 FPS to maintain the frenetic feeling of combat. For all the demands made of the graphics cards, Rage 2 is surprisingly tame when it comes to CPUs. Testing with an RTX 2080 so that the GPU is less likely to be a bottleneck, only the Ryzen 5 2400G is noticeably slower than the other processors, and it still plugs along well above 60 FPS. At lower quality settings, the gap is a bit larger, but the Ryzen 5 2600X and above are all capable of 144 FPS or more. Meanwhile, at 1440p and 4K, even with the second fastest non-Titan graphics card currently available, there's less than a 2% spread among the CPUs, not including the 2400G. For laptops, I'm limited to 1080p testing on the internal monitors, and that means all three are able to break 60fps even at ultra quality. Note, however, that these are 120Hz and 144Hz displays, though not with G-Sync, so they don't fully utilize the refresh rate. The RTX 2060 and RTX 2070 Max-Q end up delivering nearly the same performance, which we've seen in other games as well. If you're thinking about buying a Max-Q laptop, keep that in mind. You can probably save some money by dropping to a theoretically slower graphics card without really sacrificing performance or battery life. Thanks again to MSI for providing the hardware for our testing of Rage 2. This was a bit of a surprise sequel. I'm not sure anyone was really clamoring for it nearly eight years after the first game, but at least we finally know what happened to the Authority. Unfortunately, with no multiplayer to speak of and a relatively forgettable story, this is probably the end of the road for Rage. But never say never. We'll be looking at performance in more games in the future, so don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.